station's first pure newsman. My name is Pete French, representing the KYW TV newsroom for this, our exposure of gambling in Northern Ohio in 1957. Sharia's contacts led to some exposés and to some other stories that weren't crime-related. The police helped him get an exclusive interview, for instance, with Vice President Nixon when he came to town for a news conference. Sure enough, uh, minutes later, here comes this entourage of people, lights are popping, and it's the Vice President with the Secret Service and the police, and they hit the elevator button, the doors open, and boom, I get shoved in with the cameraman. And of course, inside, they explained to the vice president, hey, uh, this is uh, one of our local favorites. Carl Stern was hired by KYW fresh out of college in 1959. He started as a radio newsman, but soon switched to television. Good evening, everybody. An estimated... He covered urban renewal, interviewed Cyrus Eaton, spent election night with Governor Mike DeSalle, reported on the retrial of Sam Shepard. But his fondest memories of his Cleveland years are of less serious matters, like when the news director decided the glasses he wears made him look older and smarter and ordered him to wear them on the air. Well, we tried that for about a week, but the glare from the lights, the preset lights in the ceiling was too much, so he went out and he bought me frames frames with absolutely nothing in them at all. And for five years on the air in Cleveland, I wore frames on the air with no glass in them, which meant I couldn't see a great deal. Uh, and about once a month, just to see if anybody was really watching, I would reach through and scratch the corner of my eye. You know, the way we do. No one <laughs> ever caught it. <laughs> Ignition, Lift off. A young man named Albert Gallatin Dancy, better known as Bud, covered the first manned space flight in 1962. Bud Dancy had come to KYW the year before to anchor the noon news. Um, interestingly enough, it was one of the first half-hour newscasts uh, that was done anywhere in the country. The format that we were doing at the time has later come to be called Happy Talk News. We didn't think of it as anything except that uh, there were three guys on the show and we were all trying to relate to each other and be a little looser and a little easier. Traditionally, Ole Miss is a white man's school. It is that tradition which is causing the current friction here in the quiet town of Oxford. But by and large, Bud Dancy didn't cover happy talk stories. The KYW News Department managed to find local angles in the integration of Ole Miss, Mississippi State University seen here, Martin Luther King's Birmingham bus boycott, and the famous civil rights march on Washington in 1963. At the time, Westinghouse owned the station, and uh, you could do anything that you were man enough to do as long as it didn't cost more than $4.95. Uh, and uh, we were able to do those, uh, those trips uh, relatively cheaply and, and very quickly. In 1961, Westinghouse hired a down-on-his-luck lounge singer named Michael Dowd to host an afternoon variety show. His name was changed to Mike Douglas, and the show took off. When I went to Cleveland, I was literally on my last leg, and uh, I was received so well and got so lucky. It was the most wonderful, wonderful experience of my life. Yes, sir, that's my baby. No, sir, I don't mean maybe. Yes, sir, that's my baby now. Actually, it's something that probably only happens once in a lifetime when uh, uh, you have that kind of a situation where you all get together and uh, uh, it just all, it just all happened. It all gelled. Soupy, started here. The format was to have one guest co-host for a week. Over the years, dozens of now prominent performers were introduced to a national audience on The Douglas Show. Of course, station management didn't always appreciate the talent that came to town. One of the fondest memories, uh, going back to those days, was having a 20-year-old girl from New York by the name of Barbara Streisand as my co-host. I remember we paid her $1,000 for five 90-minute shows, and Westinghouse thought so little of her that they erased the tapes to make editorials. These are the guys we spent a couple of great weeks with. Help! These are the Beatles! Popular music was the staple of KYW Radio in the early 60s, and its DJs were as big around town as the television personalities. Some, like Jerry G, even got their own television shows. Now, here is 
George South. And KYW carried on a tradition that began in the WNBK days, live broadcasts of the Cleveland Orchestra. This rare videotape of George Zell conducting is from 1963. After a decade of legal maneuvering that included a Supreme Court decision, the Federal Communications Commission in 1965 declared the Westinghouse NBC trade of stations of a decade earlier null and void. KYW went back to Philadelphia and WKYC came to Cleveland. You're watching NBC executives leaving Philly and hearing the final seconds of KYW Radio with DJ Jay Lawrence. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is KYW Cleveland, a Group W station, Westinghouse Broadcasting in Cleveland. That's the last time you'll hear that. It's five o'clock and happy days. And here are the NBC people Striding into the station with WKYC smiles. I'll never forget that first morning. A number of people. Neil Van Els, who would later become WKYC general manager, was among the group of NBC executives who walked in that morning. And they were all lined up as though waiting execution, almost standing stiff and rigid. Uh, yes, sir, no, sir. A lot of that going on. The return of NBC to Cleveland had an immediate impact. Within four months, WKYC became Cleveland's first all-color station. Thank heaven for little girls. Lynn Sheldon was one of those who stayed when Westinghouse moved on. But others, Dick Goddard, for instance, moved to Philadelphia. I would like to introduce Wally Canan, the weatherman. And NBC brought Wally Canan, the weatherman, to Cleveland. The news team had a propensity for springing surprises on one another in those days. <laughs> oh, that's too much. Thank you, Lawrence. Wally Canan was born an Ohio farm boy, but behind his aw shucks facade lies an incredible knowledge of the weather. He got his start as a meteorologist with the Air Force, forecasting tornadoes in Oklahoma after the Second World War. He was the original TV weatherman in Oklahoma and quickly established his reliability in Cleveland. But Wally, like every weatherman, had his problems with the infamous lake effect. Uh, and you had to take that into consideration when you were forecasting because uh, the people got, got rather upset. One of their favorite expressions, as a matter of fact, was uh, to call up and say, well, I just shoveled a, a foot of partly cloudy out of my driveway this morning. Jim Grainer was the sportscaster in the news team that included Wally and Virgil Dominic, his anchor. Here's Jim with the story. The final decision on the availability of Leroy Kelly for some... Jim was the radio voice of the Browns with Gib Shanley for years. He had matinee idol looks, a classy manner, and a unique sense of humor, demonstrated in this tongue-in-cheek report he filed on college students in Florida on spring break. Just a little too rough for a man my age. Grainer was very easygoing, just a thoroughgoing professional. Uh, knew his subject, uh, was just, uh, he was laid back before the term laid back existed. Jim Grainer's distinguished career came to a tragic end in 1975. He began making uncharacteristic mistakes on the air. News director Dick Lobo gave him a leave of absence and had him get a thorough medical checkup. Uh, we got word back that they had found a uh, brain tumor and um, they put him into the Cleveland Clinic. He knew what was happening, and it was just a matter of another few months before he passed away. Probably the best-known Channel 3 story of the 1970s wasn't something we did, but something that happened to Del Donahue in 1976. On the way out, I got to thinking, something could go wrong. And for some reason that I still don't understand, I thought about my eyes. Dell was shooting a story on a lion tamer who runs his cats through their paces at suburban shopping malls. In this case, Midway Mall in Illyria. I became more famous than I would ever have imagined in about uh, 50 seconds when he decided he didn't like me, the lion. When the lion attacked, the main thing I had in my mind was to keep my head moving, which I did. 